it, I, was, I was praying this morning, and I was asking God to share with me um, out of Isaiah 7 and out of Isaiah 9 what He wanted me to say. And I had some notes written down from last night, and I really felt like God had, was, was sharing more insight with me as I was reading His Word. And I, I, I just, in my heart this morning in prayer, I, hear, I heard God whisper this, do not ever let my word and my son become boring to you. Amen. We have a tendency, especially at this time of the, or of the year, where it's so routine. We go Christmas shopping, we get, go to parties, we go and have a lot of everything that we do on Christmas. We come to church, we sing Christmas carols. And then it just becomes a very routine type of thing for us. But God wants to let us know that if we ever let His Word and let His Son and let His Holy Spirit become boring to us, then we need to reevaluate where we find ourselves in our Christian walk. I'm not getting on to you. I'm talking to myself too. Because it can become boring or routine. And you would never say that out loud. You would never come to church and say, well, this is boring. But maybe somewhere in your heart, you're thinking, you know what? We've done this. We've been here. We've bought the t-shirt. This is kind of boring. We're just going to muddle through this and then we're going to go home and we're going to do what we, what we need to do to get ready for Christmas. I want you to understand something. This is Christmas. You and I are in the process of believing and understanding and worshiping an almighty God who has brought hope into this world. Amen through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we throw words around. I know that I do. I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'll throw words around like love and faith and hope and joy and peace and, you know, uh, pleasing the Lord. And we have this own Christianese language that we use, you know, washed in the blood of the Lamb. What? You know, I mean, we get it. But we get so used to saying it that we don't really understand what we're talking about a lot of times that it's some sort of vague concept out in the middle of space and we're not really sure what we're talking about. But today I want to camp out on a word that I believe will bring joy to you, will bring satisfaction to your soul. And that, and that word is hope. Okay, and I know that we've probably exhausted the word hope in our vocabulary, but again, I want to remind you that please do not let the words of God and His Son become boring and routine and rote for you, because when you do, we need to reevaluate our hearts. The word today that I want to focus on is hope. Hope. Now, most of us, we would think hope in today's definition is kind of a wishy-washy, unsure optimism. Like, man, I hope I get that job. I hope she says yes when I ask her to marry me. I hope that uh, we get out of this financial mess. I hope the car starts this morning. I, I said that for Christy because her car won't start. <clears throat> Poor baby. But I hope, I hope that this happens or I hope that that happens and we use that as some sort of an unsure optimistic we, we want to be optimistic but we're not real sure and so we say I hope this comes through well I wanted you to know that in the Greek the actual word for hope let me find this because I can't say it in uh, El Pizzo now that's in my southern accent El Piz Pizzo and it means to expect it. To expect it. Are you expecting in the Lord? Have you put your expectations in the Lord? You see, that sounds different than when we say, have you put your hope in the Lord? Well, I hope the Lord says this, or I hope the Lord comes through on this. I hope you can expect it when the Lord says it so. And I want you to understand something today. Our hope rises and falls on every circumstance. There are times 
that we live like we're in a hopeless situation. But you are never in a hopeless situation. I want to encourage you today because let me tell you something. When Jesus came into this earth, onto this earth in a stable, in a manger, Emmanuel, God with us, when he showed up, hopelessness was erased from your vocabulary. Amen. Hopelessness is no longer in your DNA. If you say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ... I have given my life to Him. I love Him. I want to serve Him. I obey Him. I say yes to Christ being the Lord of my life. Hopelessness is no longer in your DNA because the blood of Jesus Christ literally runs through you. And there is no hopelessness in Jesus Christ. So let me say this. When Jesus says the hope of all glory, Christ inside of you is the hope of all glory. It's the expectation of all glory that it's coming. You can expect it. You can take it to the bank. That there's no unsure, optimistic, well, gosh, I hope God comes through. Now, I'm not talking about our situations. There are situations that we find ourselves in, in everyday life, that... God is using to teach us more about Him and grow us to become more like His Son, Jesus Christ. So we don't go through a situation and go, I expect you, God, to do this for me. God is going to do whatever God wants to do in your situation for His glory. Amen. That doesn't have anything to do with you expecting a favor from God. God loves you but He loves you so much, He refuses to keep you where you are. And so inside of your situations that you find yourself in, He is using those situations to grow you. So we can't expect that in a month that situation is going to be over and done with. Now it could be, but you might go on a year and you still find yourself in the situation. Now we do know that one verse in the Bible says... Let me try to get this right. You can help me. I don't mind you helping me. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So if you go through life and you're not experiencing hope in your life, then it begins to wear on you, doesn't it? I know that it does for me. I, in my situation when I was sick last year, when I was so sick... And I felt I couldn't even get out of the bed. And if I did get out of the bed, and you know the story, most of you, I had to drag my oxygen tank around everywhere I went. And I was 45 years old, and I felt like I was 85. No offense, Papa Jack, but um, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. But I did not. I felt hopeless in that situation. I felt like I was never going to get out of that situation. I remember, like it was yesterday, Rick Preets coming over and pumping I'm antibiotics through me and having to pull out an old pick line. I don't even know if you know what that is, but it's a line that goes through your veins straight to your heart. And Rick when it came over and he pulled that thing out and I had to get a new one put in and I, I, I had fevers, I had endocarditis, I had a staph infection, I was hurting and I thought where and when is this going to end? And you know what I'm talking about. You've been in a situation in your life when you think when is this going to end? I can't answer that for you except to say when God says it ends. And you can hope in that. You can put your expectation in knowing that in this season of your life, whether you are in a good situation or you find yourself in a, a wrong or bad situation, God is working it out for His glory. That's the hope I'm talking about. The hope that I'm talking about says that at the end of the day, at the end of life, at the end of the road, we will see Jesus Christ face to face in a place called heaven. Amen. The expectation of seeing Jesus face to face is what I'm excited about. I put my hope in that. That this world is not the end. That where we are right now is not where things end. And I found in... A, Isaiah chapter 7. 
the hope of all hopes was predicted. I mean, you're talking about hundreds of years before Jesus Christ came on the scene. Hundreds of years before Bethlehem. Hundreds of years before Joy to the World was written. It was the hope of all hopes. And listen to what Isaiah 7, 10 through 14 says. Later, the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. Ask your God for a sign of confirmation. I'm just throwing this first part in because I think it's funny. Ahaz, make it as difficult as you want. This is a, a message the Lord sent to the king. You ask for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz, and make it as difficult as you want. As high as heaven or as deep as the place of the dead. <clears throat> but the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. <laughs> then Isaiah said, listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of, God, patience of God as well? Basically, he's saying, stop acting all high and mighty and spiritual. Because God is talking to you right now. And then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God says he declared that the hope of all glory was coming into this world and you better get ready for him. Now this wasn't some newsboy on the corner of 42nd Street in New York City shouting it out. This was God himself saying, get ready expectation, the hope of all glory is coming into this world in just a few hundred years. Which is really not a long time compared to God. I mean, in His, in his world. But in other words, nobody else could give this type of declaration. Look at it that way. The Lord Himself declared that the hope of all glory was coming into this world. Can you imagine? There is not one person that could have declared that other than the Lord. That's how powerful of a being and person of Jesus Christ was coming in human form to this earth. I mean, the heavens were shaking when God declared that the hope of all glory is on His way. And this was hundreds of years before this actually took place. God is saying hope is on the way. It's coming. He's coming. Emmanuel. And that led me over to Isaiah 9, verse 1, and 7, 1 through 7. And let me read. This is where the hope, hope is prophesied. The hope of all glory. Jesus Christ coming down and, and, and being with us on this earth is prophesied also in Isaiah chapter 9. The reason that when we find ourselves in a bad situation, there's something in us, in our hearts or in our minds, there's something about us that's in our spirit that goes, we're going to get through this. We're going to make it through. With God's strength, I don't know how, but God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Even in the darkest of despair of times, I don't know what you thought on October 11th when you walked out of your door and you saw the havoc and the destruction that Hurricane Michael brought. But chainsaws immediately were going off in my neighborhood and we were trying to chop out uh, of our, just to get to our road because if you got to the end of our road and took a right, there were 16 more trees down the road that you couldn't move. You couldn't move. And it felt like a very hopeless situation. And situations like that come into our, our being and, and our lives and we go, this feels so hopeless. I'm filling up, I'm filling up the back of my toilet. <laughs> with rainwater, water from the creek. And I thought, I never had to do this before. I'm a city boy. What is this all about? I flush the commode, the water fills back up, and I go back on my merry way. And all of a sudden, here I am dumping river water in the back of my toilet. And I'm thinking, what's going on? Now, that's a funny example, but we all know that that was 
at that moment felt like a hopeless situation. But as we, as we lived and existed and moved, every single day we felt a little bit more hopeful, didn't we? We felt like, guess what? The trees have been cleared on my road. Now we have... What now? Discovering the light bulb? Oh yes, that was a glorious day. You talking about when you turned your power on for the first time? And... What? Oh yeah, okay, so maybe from a generator? I don't know what you're saying. Anyway, I love you though, I do. Sweetest girl in this room, but I have no idea what she's talking about. Um, but we begin to feel a little bit better and better and better and a little bit more and more hopeful. Let me tell you something, through all of that, through the situations you find yourself in right now, whether it's the hurricane, whether it's something else, guess what? God's not losing hope. God hadn't gone, oh no, Hurricane Michael just came through. What am I going to do? <laughs> then that would not be a God worth worshiping, would it? God says, I have a plan for you. A fresh wind is blowing into this area, and I am going to lift you out of the miry clay, and I'm going to set your feet on the solid rock, and I'm going to show you new and wonderful things in your life and in your marriage and in your church and in your job and in your community. Can I get an amen? Because God says, I am doing something new in your situation. Even in a hopeless situation, God is saying, I have not lost hope because I am hope. Amen. I have not lost hope because I am hope, and I will show you out of this. I will lead you out of this situation. So we feel in our hearts, in our spirits, we say, you know what? We're not hopeless. And it's the reason we feel that is because Jesus came into the world. We were hopeless before Christ. Let me just show, share that with you. Before Jesus Christ came into this world as a little baby, we were hopeless. We had no hope. We were doomed. But that wasn't God's plan. God knew exactly what He was doing when that little baby was born in that manger from a virgin named Mary. It was all planned out behind the scenes to bring us hope. And because of Jesus, because of that little baby, you, hopelessness is no longer in your DNA. Hopelessness is no longer in your vocabulary. Now you can say in a situation, I hope this happens, but, but God is going to make a way where there seems to be no way. And so what Isaiah 9 says is so incredibly rich and deep in the way that he predicts the hope that is about to come into this world. And he says this, Nevertheless, the time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. Question is, is where are you today? If you find yourself in darkness and despair, God's Word says it's not going to go on forever. Now you might be saying, well, yeah, I understand that, but that's not in context what this is talking about. Let me say this to you. God loves you, and He sent Jesus, the hope of all glory, to come and live inside of you. And I'm about to share out of Corinthians what that means, what hope actually means on a day-to-day -day basis for you and I. But what he is saying in Isaiah 9 is there is t coming a time where I am bringing hope to the world. The land of Zebulon and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Isn't that good? Oh my gosh, that is rich.
You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and the warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the armies of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. Why? Why is he saying all of this? Why is this kind of a glory coming? Why? Because verse 6 says, Because a child is born to us. A son has been given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. His government and its peace will never, ever, ever, ever end. His government and His peace will never end. Now that's rich. That's beautiful. Because we live in a government, governmental society in this moment on this earth that one day will end. One day it will collapse. As a matter of fact, it's shut down right now. The government is shut down right now. And I, I feel horrible about it. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can go on with life because the government shut down. But my point is this. The governments of this world will finally come to an end. So why in the world would we put hope in a government that will come to an end? You see, God and His kingdom and His strength and in His power he has a government that will never end. He has a peace and a government that will never, ever end. The creator of all things, the one true living God, the great and glorious, perfect God has a government that will never end and you and I are a part of that kingdom. So that's what he's saying. There is a wonderful child coming. There is a son that's given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the front throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Now that's called hope. When God himself says the passionate commitment. I love the verse and I say it all the time. That even when I am unfaithful, God is faithful. Because he can't deny himself. Okay? So take that verse and apply it to this verse. The passionate commitment of a faithful God who will never be unfaithful because he cannot deny himself. He is going to make this happen. The hope of all glory. So why? Why do we have to be excited about this? I'm excited... Because we face so many hopeless situations in this world. I mean, we really do. But first, or 2 Corinthians 4 reminds us that because of this baby Jesus that was born into this world, we can have hope. And this is what 2 Corinthians 4 says, Therefore, since God in His mercy has given us a new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We try we don't try we don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are but servants for His sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light, this hope, shine in our heart. 
so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Now we have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars. I would say it like this in the context of this message. We ourselves find ourselves in hopeless situations. We're fragile, but we're containing this great treasure. And this makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. The great power that you and I walk around in to overcome sin to speak into people's lives is not coming from your, your, you. It's coming from God. It's not coming from your, the reason you, you come to church every Sunday is so that you can have this great power. God has given you this power. Now that does not mean do not come to church on Sundays. Don't be like, well, I don't need to go to church. Yes, you do. You need to go to church and this is a rabbit trail because you need to make a commitment to God's people and your family to be here. Amen. But then he says, thank you, Rick. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts. We know that this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars. I've already read that. Here's where the hope comes in. This is where the hope comes in in an everyday uh, battle that we face. The expectation of God is going to do something. He says we're pressed on every side by troubles. Raise your hand if you believe that. <laughs> You're pressed on every side by trouble. But we are not crushed because of the hope of all glory has come into this world. And we might be pressed on every side by our troubles, but we are never crushed. We are perplexed or confused at times. Satan is the author of confusion. If you are confused in your marriage, then you need to begin listening to God speak into your marriage and quit leaning on the lies and listening to the lies. If you are finding yourself confused in your spiritual walk, God is not the author of confusion. God is the author of peace. God is the author of discernment in your mind. And if you find yourself confused about who God is, then you are listening to the wrong person. We now have this light shining in our hearts. We're pressed on every side. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. And we are hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. Why? Because of Emmanuel. Amen. Because Jesus Christ was born in a manger and lived on this earth and taught us what it was like to live a life, a godly life, and then went to the cross and died on the cross so that you and I could have hope. Not an optimistic, wishy-washy kind of, I hope this works out, I hope it doesn't work, I mean, I hope it does work out, or, you know, whatever. We're talking about the actual word which means expect it to happen Amen. expectation are you expecting God to work your situation out in your life are you expecting God to make something uh, available to you a path where there seems to be no path are you expect are you putting your hope in God let me pray father we thank you for this word and um, we just pray father that you use it Father, never let us get tired of listening to the story of Christmas. Let us never become bored with the Christmas season and what it represents. Not the materialistic part of this, Lord, but the part that has meaning. The real reason for this season is, is you. And we say that so much and it just becomes cliche to say, but Father, it's so true. Where would we be without this season that you chose to bring your son, the light of the world, into this, onto this earth? Amen. Church, just reflect on that for just a minute. Just reflect on where you would be if that wasn't God's plan. We would be hopeless. Would we would be directionless. We would be doomed. But God had a plan, and that plan was to bring us hope. Thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.